Hello, this is Kevin Prince, and I'm going to say welcome back one more time for the Market Insights webinar. We're so pleased each week to be able to provide some new insights to the overall market for each of you. And we're also so pleased that you take the time to join us each one of these sessions. And more importantly, on top of that, a number of you have taken the time to send us a few questions for us to answer. And that is so critical for us because effectively that helps us drive the content for each one of these events on a go forward basis. There's a real good ideas that come from them and we really appreciate that. So thanks again for joining us. And again, one more time, thank you for taking the time to send us a question too. With that, let's get into it. Like in all previous sessions before, I wanna quickly highlight that this is market insights. We're not gonna give you specific recommendations, nor can we give you specific advice but we can give you some generic, uh, some general information around the market and give you some insights for your consideration. Today, who do I have joining me today? Well, a new shake up the lineup, so I'm pretty happy to see that. Aaron Allen, welcome to the welcome to the Market Insights. Glad to have you on board. And then also Chris McCaney, welcome across the board. Chris is one of our portfolio managers, and Aaron comes from our product management group. So looking forward to give you some again insights today. This session. Let's start off as we always do. I always like to start off with a little bit of tools to help you navigate the marketplace. And here's one that I've been utilizing from time to time. It is coming from a, a, a website called Stock Chase. I encourage you to Google it. And inside there, if you're ever looking for kind of a independent uh, analysis or sorry, independent thoughts on any uh, particular stock out there or ETF, you can do that by going to this uh, Stock Chase tool. You type in the respective ticker. I'm showing you some examples of some Bevo ones, and you can see some people making some mentions on them. It effectively grabs the, uh, the, the, you know, the messaging that's going on in BNN on a regular basis and repurposes it here. Now, so, it's not gonna have always updated information on all the tickers out there. Don't expect that. It's really just capturing the last time somebody talked about it on, uh, on uh, BNN or so. So anyway, nice little tool might further complement you in your quest to find out information on various securities as well as various ETFs out there. So our topic today, to give you some background, we mentioned already is all around alternatives. This is something that's been really a bigger discussion thread. Now, now it's coming to be more of an inter industry when we say discussion thread. Uh, so what we're gonna do today and the next session is we're gonna take some time and really kind of give you some insights, education specifically, in around what alternatives are and what we mean by that terminology, because it's just another term but I think you'll find it is a, a, a new way to think about your portfolio construction as we get into it. And with that, let's start off with Aaron. When we talk about the world of alternatives, I think the backdrop we need to layer in there is how portfolios are evolving, the portfolio construction is evolving. And I know you put together the slide, maybe you could talk to that for the, uh, the listeners. For sure, thanks, Kevin. Um, so yeah, the slide really says it all. Um, traditionally, we've seen the most typical blend of a portfolio is that 60-40 equity to fixed income mix, which you know historically has done fairly well. Uh, but where alternatives come in is uh, really when both equities and fixed incomes are having a challenging environment. And we've seen instances of this more and more frequently. Uh, we saw it in 2018 in the rising rate environment where both equities and fixed income had a challenging time. Um, but really, investors are starting to notice that no longer can we say this traditional mix of stocks and bonds is, is getting the job done. Uh, we've also had to become a bit more aggressive in terms of our search for higher yields, given the low rate environment we've been in for some time now. So all these things are kind of why we're starting to take more notice of alternatives. Alternatives yeah. uh, typically have a lower correlation to traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds. So it can really help in navigating these volatile markets and these periods when, when fixed income and equity are moving together. Uh, so again, the slide says it all, that it shows how portfolios have evolved. Uh, and looking back 10 and 20 years, um, what we would need in the portfolio in order to meet a similar risk adjusted return. So you, we need to be thinking about alternative asset classes and strategies. And I think that's the key there. It's the risk adjusted return you're taking and the composition to get to that similar risk adjusted return across the board. Um, and you, what you really highlight here is just the evolution of portfolio construction over time. Okay, so with that backdrop, and you've got a big blue area there, it says alternative. So let's let's dive into alternatives. What do we mean by that terminology? Let's, let's spend some time on that. And I know, again, you put together a nice slide. So walk us through the definition of alternatives for the, the listeners out there. 
Yeah, so the, the list of alternatives is very long and encompasses a lot of different things, but for us, uh, when we think about alternatives, we're looking for characteristics of the investment. We're looking for something, as I mentioned, that has a very low correlation to traditional equity and fixed income. So this can translate into specific asset classes like real estate and commodities, which are more well-known, or investments that are less widely known or have historically been reserved for institutions and high net worth individuals. And those are things like hedge funds and private equity. So the idea of the alternative sleeve is that investors can enhance the diversification of their portfolio by including these asset classes or strategies that have lower correlation. Um, you know, I mentioned real estate and commodities, for example, these can also serve as inflation hedges as well. Um, but if you go to the next slide, there's actually two different types of alternative investments. There's the alternative assets and there's alternative strategies. We're going to park alternative strategies because that's the focus, uh, Kevin, of next week's call. Um, and the focus of today's call is going to be on alternative assets. So examples of alternative assets, commodities, currencies, infrastructure, REITs, or real estate investment trusts. Basically, these are holdings that are typically underrepresented within a standard investment portfolio. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I'll state that alternatives have historically been accessed solely through a brokerage or for institutions, um, but through financial innovation, changing regulations, as well as the introduction of less expensive versions of alternative assets. We've now been seeing them become more accessible to everyday investors who would not have been eligible in the past. And today we're going to talk about some ETFs. Having alternatives available in ETFs is very important. There's no minimums and they're also very liquid. They trade on an exchange, so it's simple to get into and out of them. Um, and then additionally, they offer greater transparency when it comes to the holdings and the actual investment processes. So there's a lot of benefits to looking to ETFs as an alternative. Well, thanks for that, Aaron. And that's a good backdrop for the conversation, kind of put what the terminology of alternative is in is. Let's uh, jump in there, Chris, because Aaron already mentioned a few, and I know you're going to dive into a little more deeper on each one of these things, but effectively, you've got a, a chart put together here on real estate, ZRE, gold, which is gold company, ZGD, infrastructure for ZGI, and then, of course, the MSCI world is kind of a backdrop uh, comparison point. And uh, walk us through this, and I think spend some time a little bit, too, on that correlation matrix there, too, if you can. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. And as you say, these are three different areas that we've identified as alternative assets, um, but they're packaged in an ETF to make it available to a retail investor. Um, obviously, when we talk about, um, you know, whether it be real estate or actual infrastructure or things like that, you know, the retail investor can't access those directly. Uh, a retail investor can't buy an office building, for example, to get exposure to real estate. And so we're looking at three different sectors here that are listed companies that are involved in each of these areas. And the main goal of this chart really is to show that, you know, as Aaron mentioned earlier, when we're adding alternatives into our portfolio, when you think about that standard 60-40 portfolio, plain vanilla equities mixed with some level of fixed income, uh, the reason we add alternatives into that is for that diversification benefit. You want to see different sources of potential return. And you can see on the growth chart on the left, the MSCI world is that thicker line. And so that's sort of a proxy for global equity markets. You can see each of the other three um, really moving around in different ways than, than what the broad market is doing. In particular, you can see in particular the ZGD doing that. Um, and so that's just really illustrating that as there may be potential issues in certain equity markets, um, you know, that may, these alternative asset classes may be unaffected and may be going in the opposite direction. And that's really what we want to see. If you look at the correlation chart over on the right hand side, look at that bottom row. That's the MSCI world and the correlation of those broad equities to each of those other three areas. And for those that don't know, correlation is a measure that's between positive one and negative one. So, two different investments that have a correlation of positive one move in sync completely together 100% of the time. And conversely, a negative one correlation would mean they move in the exact opposite direction at all times. 
So typically, uh, and then when, when a correlation is zero, that means there's just absolutely no relationship between two different investments. So you can see the MSCI world along the bottom there has about a 0.48 correlation to real estate, almost a zero to those gold equities, and just about a 0.6, let's call it, to the global infrastructure stock. So those are all relatively low correlations, particularly, again, the gold equities there, um, which indicate that as um, broad equities are doing one thing, these uh, exposures might be doing something different. And again, that's the goal of adding alternatives into the portfolio is to get that benefit of diversification. That makes a lot of sense when you talk about portfolio construction, of course, right? Uh, exactly what Aaron start, kicked it off with. Now, I know what you did, and I appreciate this, Chris. You took each one of these three, and we do a little dive into each one of those sectors, the infrastructure, the gold, and the REITs. Let's spend some time and... and, and Take a look at those little, uh, those aspects of alternative asset classes. First of all, infrastructure. Walk us through that, and maybe the different types of infrastructures out there too. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, infrastructure obviously a very broad um, category or a very broad subject. So just to drill down a little bit in terms of what we think about when we're when we're talking about actual infrastructure. Um, again, this is something that most investors. You know, it's hard to get exposure to just through regular um, um, brokerage accounts. It's hard to buy on an exchange or things like that. And so what you have to do is buy the companies that are involved in these areas. And so what are some of these areas? Well, traditional utilities, uh, you know, those companies that deliver the gas and electricity and water to homes and offices um, and buildings around around the world and around the country, of course. But we're also talking about um, you know, stocks that might be classified in the industrial sector, companies that are airport operators or own and operate airports, marine ports, and the like, tied to industrial production for the most part. Um, and then one thing that actually a lot of investors don't think about when they think about infrastructure specifically, and I think is actually a very compelling area to, to look at, is something that's actually classified as real estate but it's the cell phone tower operators. And so these are actually, again, classified as REITs, and we will be talking about real estate um, more specifically as well. These companies, I wouldn't say are direct real estate companies, but they are classified that way because they own the property upon which cell phone towers are built. And when you think about that technology um, and the investment that's going into building out 5G networks, both in North America and globally, um, and as well, just the, again, the, the obviously global adoption of mobile devices, these are the companies that are going to benefit from all the investment that's being put into that area right now. As we upgrade the equipment uh, of these cell phone towers to get faster and faster networks and to carry more and more bandwidth, you know, that industry is really only going in one direction, as we know. And then, of course, lastly, there's the energy sort of component. Um, of, of, you know, those oil and gas, the storage and transportation. So, you know, we're not talking about um, companies that are mining oil or, or gas. We're just talking about those that are moving it from point A to point B, you know, from the source to the destination, so to speak. And that's really what, you know, the bulk of what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about listed global infrastructure. Well, thanks, Zach, Chris. Let's spend a little bit more time and talk about infrastructure because, you know, I know you put together a couple of slides here on why infrastructure, but it's really talking about maybe give us some insights around that specifically about why infrastructure as an asset class in these in these markets and maybe the factoring, of course, the, the markets, you know, the, the elections, that kind of stuff coming up. Sure. And so, you know, you, you might be able to intuitively guess, you know, some of these things after talking about the type of companies that we're looking at. Um, when we're talking about global infrastructure, but for the most part, a lot of these are very steady and stable companies. You're not getting a huge amount of growth potentially out of these, um, but you're not getting, you know, big downside risks either, because for the most part, these are well-established companies, um, you know, that have established businesses that have high barriers to entry. You know, you're not going to be able to just simply set up a new water utility in a city and create a competitive market for this. You have one operator that's in that place, in that city or that ge geographic region. And, you know, essentially a lot of these companies just make a fee based on the amount of water or gas or whatever it is going through those pipes. And, you know, so they are highly regulated in some areas for the most part, um, but that gives a very predictable return stream. 
And at the same time, a lot of these return streams that you're getting are linked to inflation. So as inflation goes up, um, guess what? The cost of that gas is going up as well, or the cost of whatever is going through there. Um, you know, we talk about airport operators as well, the fees that airports charge to airlines and to consumers that are that are built into those airport uh, air, air, airline prices that we pay. Um, and so you get a very stable return stream that come out of these companies, um, highly predictable, uh, linked to inflation as well. So as that uh, picture of inflation goes up or down, you don't really have to worry about is my income stream going to be keeping pace with the rising cost of living, um, because for the most part, these things are linked to that. Now, I did say there's you know, not as much upside growth, but certainly we do see a lot of potential um, growth in terms of the investment that's coming into infrastructure as emerging markets build out infrastructure, first of all, but then also um, developed markets. I think one of the few things that are actually that's actually you know agreed upon across party lines you know depending what country you're looking at whether it's uh you know what political party you're looking at one thing most political parties actually do agree on is the need to continually invest in infrastructure to upgrade you know those roads those those bridges all of that um is an element of uh you know maintaining what these cities already have and then of course rebuilding it as it ages over time and so you know there's a lot of attention being paid to the u.s election right now and who's going to win that election and what it means for policy in different sectors in the in the market um, but again one thing that i think um, you know most uh, politicians do agree on um, and should get some investment is the fact that infrastructure uh, investment is needed now also um, if you go to the next slide looking at specifically accessing this through equities. And we did you know, allude to this before as well. Um, it's extremely difficult, obviously, for an individual investor to just buy some cell phone towers or to buy an airport and operate that airport or to buy an office building and, and, and the like. And so um, you know, having a very easy way to access uh, this sort of uh, operational, these operating companies um, you know, being able to do that on the exchange like you're buying any other stock uh, makes it very easy for individual investors to do. And then, of course, along with that comes the liquidity aspect. These are generally very large assets um, that have a, you know, it's not exactly clear, um, you know, how much an airport is worth or how much uh, some cell towers are worth. But when you're buying on the exchange through equities, you can see that price with certainty. And you can trade in and out of that, you know, even in the same day if you wanted to, of course, but you can get into that exposure very easily. You can get back out of that exposure very easily as well. Um, and for most retail investors, that's exactly what they're looking for. Um, they're not actually looking to, you know, buy a long lived asset, hold that asset for 30 years, and then maybe sell that one day. Uh, investors just want that, that growth potential and that return stream that comes associated with that sector. And so that's why we think even though we're talking about diversifying that plain vanilla equity exposure, um, you know, it does make a lot of sense to access these areas through equities. Perfect, Chris. That's a good uh, snapshot on uh, infrastructure as an alternative and a, as, as a complement to one's portfolio. Let's shift gears and let's talk about real estate, REITs itself. And you have a different perspective on REITs and I've heard from a few people out there. Maybe walk us through your, your, your perspective on this REITs versus the 10 year yield. Sure, and so maybe just a quick, you know, definition or clarification is what, what are REITs? You know, what are we talking about when we say the word REIT? You know, essentially uh, it's, it's like an investment trust similar to a fund for the most part. You get access to a company that owns a portfolio of properties. Um, and, you know, obviously they collect rent on those properties that they own and through the REIT structure, pass through those rents uh, to the end investor. And so an investor in a REIT is essentially owning a diversified portfolio of properties that collects um, you know, some, some level of uh, rental payments on that. And then at the same time, the value of that underlying property can go up over time as well. And so that cash flow is one of those main reasons investors would look at REITs. And so essentially what I've done here is the, the chart you see on slide 12 is that that distribution that you're getting from REITs 
you know, again, think of it as those monthly rental payments um, or mortgage payments, you know, in a similar fashion. Those monthly payments you're getting from owning those REITs relative to what you're getting from the Canadian federal 10-year bond. Um, and if you take a look at this chart, you can see we're really near the highs of where we have been since essentially the 2008 financial crisis. And so the valuation is certainly very attractive right now. Now, certainly there is a reason why valuations are attractive. You know, real estate does face some headwinds based on the lockdowns that we've had over the first part of 2020 and potentially continuing on into the future for, for an indefinite period of time. Obviously, there's no clarity as to, um, you know, how long it will take for economies to reopen. Um, but real estate, we think, provides that very strong uptick in terms of the cash flow you can get while you're waiting for that uh, reopening to take place. And we think, you know, again, this does not take into account any increase in valuation of the underlying properties that these real estate uh, companies own as well. Um, you know, just looking at this chart, you can see really the only other time since 2008 um, that we reached this level of spread over the Canadian tenure was in early 2016. You know, if you did buy into real estate at that time, um, you know, the following six months provided a 22% return um, in terms of total return. Um, so, you know, the valuation of those companies coming up very quickly, uh, coming out of that spike. We might suggest that this time you might see a longer recovery period. It might not be 22% over six months, um, but as um, economies reopen and, and, and regain some level uh, of normalcy, you, you should see some increase in valuations there as well. Um, and at the same time, again, you're collecting that, that distribution while you're waiting for that uh, growth potential to occur. Well, thanks, uh, Chris. And, you know, the other thing, too, of course, there's a few ways to access the REITs. And we always talk about looking underneath the hood. Um, maybe give us a little perspective. The, you know, there's a couple of ETFs out there. There's, of course, uh, XRE, ZRE, and actually VRE, VRE, too, for that matter. Market capitalization, equal weight, but when you look underneath the hood, maybe give some perspective of that. Yeah, and this is where investors have to, you know, start to do their homework because, you know, not all uh, REIT ETFs are built the same, obviously. And, you know, in particular in this in this area where you might be, you know, again, certain sectors facing some potential headwinds uh, when it comes to recovery, um, you might think, okay, well, I'm not too bullish on the retail landscape in terms of uh, real estate. I, I'm not sure, you know, there's going to be a huge uh, rush back to malls and things like that. But residential might be okay. There's certainly a demand for property right now. Um, industrial uh, REITs, this is where industrial production takes place. And, you know, most of these companies are still running. Um, you know, whether you can visit them in a store or not, you know, that industrial production is still happening. Um, and then, of course, there's office REITs. Uh, REITs that are diversified across all of these sectors, and then healthcare REITs as well, which we think um, obviously is very important right now as well. And so depending on how these ETFs are built, as you mentioned, XRE is a market cap weight uh, exposure to these underlying companies. ZRE is an equal weight, and so you see a bit more balance uh, in terms of the different sectors of REITs that you have exposure to. And so for an investor that does want exposure to REITs or think there could be potential um, you know, in that valuation that we were just talking about, take a look at the different REIT ETFs that are out there and make sure you're comfortable with the different types of underlying exposure that you're getting um, and so, so that you're not potentially concentrated in one area that maybe you didn't want to be in, so to speak. And we do think the outlook for each of these different areas of real estate could be potentially different over the next one, two, and three years. And so again, do your homework uh, in terms of how these ETFs are built and what the underlying exposure is that you're getting. Thanks for that, Chris. And let's close off here with, a, of course, one of more topical thing, uh, gold out there. And I know you've done your own view, uh, own outlook around gold because we have a conversation from time to time. So share some insights that the investors can take a look at too and give us a perspective around that as, a, as an asset class. And certainly gold does do something different. You showed us already on the correlations. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that really drives the gold price is, you know, currency devaluation. And, you know, back at, coming out of 2008, 2009, a lot of investors were introduced to the uh, 
uh, the terminology quantitative easing. This is something that a lot of investors weren't really aware was a toolkit in, in the central bank, um, you know, toolbox. Uh, but it is something that was brought out after 2009, after a very long period of time before anyone had seen it previously. Essentially, quantitative easing is another term for, for printing money. Um, and so the expansion of the money supply. And as an emergency measure, again, coming out of 2009, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. announced a quantitative easing program. That's uh, on this chart termed as QE1. And you know, again, just for perspective, at the time, this was seen as an extraordinary measure, an extraordinary amount of money being printed and created and the monetary supply expanding. And then obviously over the next few years, um, more and more rounds of this quantitative easing were added and you can see QE2 and QE3 being part of that. And the cumulative effect of the amount of money that was added to the money supply. And again, this is just from a US perspective. So this is just the US Federal Reserve and we've seen this, um, you know, happen from central banks around the world. Um, and so, you know, this, again, has an effect of increasing the money supply. And what that does is gold is priced in U.S. dollars. Gold is a finite asset. Um, it can't increase in supply like other um, currencies can. And so when the money supply increases, that tends to have an increase in the value of gold. If U.S. dollars are going to go down in value over time, then the, the amount of dollars it costs to buy gold will go up. And so the one thing I just put on here was the most recent announcement um, that was announced in early March uh, based on, uh, you know, the, again, the Federal Reserve providing a backstop to the global economy. On this chart, it's marked as QE4. They didn't officially call it quantitative easing four, but on this chart, it's called QE4. And I just wanted to give a perspective in terms of how big the expansion of the, mon of the money supply is going to be right now in response to, to the COVID shutdown and how that pales in comparison to the amount of QE we saw previously. Um, and so just the, the huge amount of monetary expansion that's going to be going on, not just in the U.S., but globally, we think really puts a very strong uh, sort of tailwind behind the price of gold. And if you go to the next chart, um, this really puts it in, in other terms as well. Um, the blue line uh, on this chart is what we call the, the real yield. And this is a, a measure from the Federal Reserve uh, in the U.S. themselves. It's a calculation they do. And it's essentially looking at the yield on the 10-year bond uh, minus inflation. And it's their calculation of inflation. So this is what the Federal Reserve considers inflation. Um, and so you can see really, you know, going back several years, the only other time this was negative in that 2011 to 2013 period, and you can see that orange line, what the price of gold did during that period. So negative real yield, a huge boost to the, potentially the price of gold. And you can see now on the right hand side of this chart, we are getting back into that area and in fact are lower in terms of real yield relative to at, at any other time in history. And so we think this really just provides, again, a huge tailwind for the price of gold. When you have the head of the, the central bank saying that they're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates, um, you know, low to negative real yields, we think are gonna be here for a long time. And again, that just goes to um, the case for, for buying or, or getting exposure to gold um, as a source of return outside of traditional equities. And Crick, uh, quickly close off on the on the thoughts around gold. One slide we shared in the past, maybe just give a little bit of the three different aspects, three different ways of accessing uh, gold for the uh, listeners here. Sure. And, and so, yeah, for the investor that that is sold and says, okay, I want to buy some gold. I need that gold exposure. Real negative yields are here. I need exposure to gold. What are the different ways to do that? Um, the first um, is somewhat straightforward, and again, we're getting back into equities here, uh, but the first is to buy stocks that are involved in the production and mining of gold. And so, you know, you could, you could think of uh, uh, Yamana Gold, Barrick Gold, these sort of companies that are mining and producing gold and distributing it to, to, um, to, to end clients or end, end users. And, you know, what are the advantages of that? Obviously, you know, again, the liquidity aspect, you're buying stocks that are on the exchange, 
You don't have to worry about different um, functions of the, the actual gold market itself. There's no storage costs like there is with physical gold. And when you're buying the companies that are operating in that area, there's a natural leverage to the price of gold. So the upside potential by buying equities um, could be higher than what the actual upside is from, from gold itself. You know, the, the one disadvantage, of course, is that there is operating risk. Um, you know, the stocks can behave more like stocks than the price of gold. And so if you, you know, are just looking at the price of gold, um, the return you get from these equities could potentially be different. Um, you know, I say the potential is higher, but it could not be as high as well. So that's one way. Um, the other, the, the next way to buy gold is to buy uh, an ETF, and there are several out there, that actually buy physical gold. And so you can buy an ETF or invest in an ETF that for every unit holder has a bar of gold in a safe uh, with a custodian somewhere in the world. And so what you're doing there, even though you're not actually holding it and putting it under your mattress, is you are actually owning a piece of gold, the, the, the commodity itself. And so, you know, what, what you're getting there is obviously the exposure to that price of gold that we're talking about. And it's very, very one, almost a one for one basis. Um, you know, the difference uh, here is that, you know, there are storage costs. So there is a vault that you have to pay for um, to hold that gold. Um, and in the case of other commodities, uh, you know, not all commodities can be storable. And we're thinking more about agriculture and things like that when we talk about um, commodities that aren't storable. Uh, but in the case of gold specifically, obviously it is storable, but you do have to worry about what those storage costs are, who's the custodian that's actually owning or, or running this, this gold um, storage. And so there are other considerations to think about. And then thirdly, you can invest in an ETF that is futures-based that actually you know, turns around and buys gold futures. So this is a synthetic exposure um, where you're, you're essentially buying futures that are tied to the price of gold. Um, you know, the downside there is that you, know, you, you can track very closely potentially to the price of gold, but the downside is that there is potential issues with rolling from one month to the next, um, and then uh, you know, potentially having this, this this idea of contango where the price of gold for next month is higher than the price of gold for this month. And as you roll those contracts, there could be a negative carry to that. So each with their own pros and cons in terms of how to access gold, but obviously a variety of decisions. There are a variety of choices as well. Thanks for that, Chris. Very good background there on the different choices, specifically when they're thinking about the alternative asset classes. So with that, let's shift gears here. I've got a couple of good questions coming in. Really, again, thank you so much for the listeners for providing the questions. They really help us, uh, again, help structure our content, specifically even around alternatives. It's from a, a question we got in from a listener. Um, now, of course, there's some, uh, you, you already talked about REITs itself. So I don't need to spend too much time in there from this listener, but what they're effectively is a little concerned about that area. So maybe Chris, and you've got a good background in derivatives, give us some ways that you can maybe play the opposite side of REITs, uh, real estate in this in, in Canada? Sure. And so, you know, there, specifically to the question, uh, you know, I, I'm not aware of any ETF um, that actually shorts real estate. Um, of course, the benefit of ETFs is that you can short the ETF itself, you know, similar to, to shorting a stock. And obviously, you'd have to work with your brokerage to do that through through the proper channels. Um, but But certainly, you could short one of those ETFs we discussed. And again, there are one or two others out there in Canada as well. Um, so you can short that ETF directly. Um, the other thing you can do uh, is to take a look at the options market. And you know, one or two of these ETFs have options listed on them. And so when you wanna make a bet on an investment going down, typically you would buy a put option and the put option increases in value as the value of the underlying investment goes down. Now, you know, both shorting the ETF directly and then the, the purchasing of puts as well, they come with their own, again, sort of uh, pros and cons as well. So, you know, borrowing costs is one thing just for shorting a stock, uh, margin calls, of course. And then when you get into the options market, there's things like implied volatility, um, you know, theta burn uh, for those invest, um, familiar with options. And then, of course, just the, the upfront cost of buying that put option uh, in order to hope uh, that some of these investments go down and then your put option would increase in value. Options, of course, the other thing I would mention is that there is obviously a maturity to them and so you have to have your timing 
uh, very right as well if you're going to wade into the options market. But for someone that's a bit bearish or negative on the real estate market, those are a couple of different things you could look at um, to, to get that access. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. A couple more questions coming in. Let's see if I'm going to get through today. Bear with me. Um, oh, somebody owns a ZEQ out there. Thank you very much. Uh, the BMO MSCI Europe high quality hedged uh, Canadian index. Um, somebody's looking for an unhedged version, uh, but on USD. Uh, maybe you can uh, walk us through that, Aaron. I think you got some good news on that one. Sure. Well, I don't know if I have good news. We don't have a .u version of the ZEQ. Uh, we do have a .u version of ZUQ, which is our US high quality. Um, but that's definitely something that we may look at in the future. Okay, well, perfect. I mean, I know you recently launched the ZUQ.U, and it certainly is a good consideration of the future. So we thank you very much for your thoughts out there. Um, oh, uh, quick question for you there, Chris. And taking a look at uh, edge ETFs, uh, thought process there is really about is edge ETFs, and is a, it's a specific ETF, is that a, a smart beta, is that fits into the smart beta category? Uh, maybe get your thoughts there on that, Chris. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think the ETF that's being referred to here, the, the ticker is EDGE, and it's um, it's an innovation ETF. And so really, um, when you take a look at that one in particular, that's, I would say that's more of a thematic um, investment itself. You know, if you're, if you're of the belief that companies involved in innovation, and I believe it's a global ETF as well, uh, if you want exposure to that, you know, that's that's one avenue for you. Um, the way that might differ from smart beta ETFs, you know, smart beta tends to put a tilt on the broad market. And so um, it'll start with a broad market exposure and then tilt it to things like either low volatility or dividends or momentum or or, or whatever. And so that's that's really what we talk about um, smart as smart beta. Um, versus what we think this is more of a thematic uh, ETF. And I would say really in, in either case, again, it's something where investors really have to do a lot of their homework. Um, do I want exposure to this theme in my portfolio? Um, maybe the answer is yes, but then also how is this portfolio constructed? What is the index behind it and what companies am I actually investing in? Um, and so thematic ETFs, really that extra level uh, of, of of homework and due diligence, I think, on the part of investors. Thanks again for that, Chris. And that's all the time we're going to have for today. I do want to make a shout out. We're going to be back again next week at one o'clock. We're going to take some time and dive into now the alternative strategies and highlight some ways you can access those in the overall marketplace. Between now and then, if you have some questions on ETFs, feel free to uh, the, add them into the next uh, response. We send the email out about the announcement of the session because we'd love to hear from you on that. And with that, have yourself a good week ahead. Cheers.